Had you not accumulated $400,000 in savings? I bought a new house with that money. Jane, my mother-in-law, told me one day that she had purchased a home without even telling me. I became enraged and questioned my spouse about the circumstance, but he started to stand up for his mother, saying, Let her do what she wants. Let's abandon the $400,000 endeavor. I promised to exact retribution on them both, since I could not allow such an atrocity to go unpunished. Rose is my name. Tom and I are weed. We were employed by the same food manufacturing company five years ago. Even though it was difficult for us to spend much time together due to our busy careers, we managed to maintain a pleasant marriage. But I didn't get along well with my mother-in-law, Jane, right away. Jane had asked, You're planning to quit your job and support Tom after marrying him, aren't you? When I first went to see Tom's family to announce our engagement, no, I answered. After our marriage, I want to keep working. After talking about it, Tom supports my desire to continue working. Isn't it normal for a bride to quit her job and support her husband at home after getting married? Jane went on. When I married my late husband, I quit my job and spent my life as a housewife. Though I couldn't tell Jane this, I thought the idea that a wife should give up her work was out of date. All I could say in response was a sly smile. Is Tom really okay with you continuing to work? When he comes home tired from work, and you're not there, it will increase his burden, Jane said. That's only your opinion, Mom, Tom said. I'm fine with it. Please let Rose do as she pleases. Thanks to Tom stepping in and stopping his mother, we weren't subjected to any more snide remarks and left his parents' house without further incident. I thanked Tom for standing up for me. If you hadn't intervened, I might have faced more unpleasant comments. My dad passed away, and since then my mom has been raising me on her own, Tom said. She probably just worries. Don't think too much about it. I felt fortunate to be married to such a thoughtful person. As we headed back to our apartment, I reflected on how peaceful our life together had been. However, one day after five years of marriage, Tom suggested living with his mother. Hey, we often leave the house empty because of work. How about moving in with my mom? He proposed. Honestly, I don't like that idea, I said. Is that so? Sorry for bringing it up. Suddenly forget I mentioned it, Tom said. I was taken aback by the suggestion but relieved when Tom quickly accepted my response. We did end up living together, which was a relief. A week later, after Tom's suggestion, I returned home from a long day at work around 9 o'clock p.m. I was exhausted and muttering to myself as I tried to unlock the door, only to find it already open. Tom usually contacts me when he gets home, but he must have forgotten today. Entering the house, I called out, I'm home. Oh, you finally come back, Jane said, appearing in the living room. Tom hasn't come back yet. He gave me a spare key. What? I said, stunned. Tom had given a spare key to his mother without informing me. I was frozen in place as Jane continued. Don't just stand there. Can you prepare dinner? I've been waiting for you to come back. Um, Mom, haven't you eaten? Yet, I asked, bewildered. Yes, she replied, as if it was perfectly normal for her to enter my house uninvited and expect dinner. Her audacity was astonishing. I was reluctant to confront Jane directly, but I couldn't just ignore her. Is that so? All right. I can only make something simple. Is that okay with you? I said, noticing some ingredients were missing. It felt like the fridge was more empty than it had been when I checked yesterday. Something easy is fine. Please hurry up. I'm hungry, she said. Please wait a moment. I'll prepare it right away. I responded, 
trying to accommodate her request. I quickly prepared a meal and served it to Jane. Thank you. I'll eat now, she said. After taking a sip of the miso soup I made, Jane remarked, What is this? It doesn't taste good. I was taken aback. Did she really just say my miso soup wasn't good? It doesn't taste good, she repeated. Didn't you hear me? Jane's criticism was unmistakable. It seems you can only make such meals because you're always busy with work, Jane continued. You should quit your job and focus on the household. But Tom says he likes the meals I cook, I countered. That must be flattery. Can't you even understand that? She snapped. It was clear she disapproved of my working after marriage. For the next hour, Jane continued to make snide remarks. I'll be visiting often from now on, so make sure you take care of the house properly, she said before leaving in a seemingly good mood after airing her grievances. About thirty minutes later, Tom came home. Hey, did you give a spare key to your mom? I asked. Oh yeah, I did, Tom replied. I was surprised to see her suddenly at our place today. After making her dinner, she said it was bad. Well, these things happen. Don't worry about it, Tom said casually. What kind of attitude is that? I protested. She suddenly shows up, mocks the food I made, and you're telling me to just endure it. This all started because you gave her the spare key. Tom's temper flared. If you had agreed to live with her, it would have been better. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. I don't need dinner. Am I to blame? You were the one who agreed to this. I said, feeling heartbroken by his response. The next day and the day after, the situation didn't improve. The room is messy and it doesn't look like you've cleaned properly. The laundry is all wrinkled and unsightly. Jane complained every time she visited. Her frequent visits and constant dissatisfaction were becoming unbearable. I might have been able to tolerate her remarks, but a week after she started visiting often, it felt like my patience was wearing thin. I noticed something strange. The food supplies were dwindling again, and the detergent we had stocked up on was also missing. Our apartment and my in-law's house are only a ten-minute walk apart, and it was clear that the daily disappearance of food and household items was abnormal. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but it seemed Jane might be taking them without permission. One day when she came over, I decided to confront her, hoping it was just a misunderstanding. Mom, you haven't been taking our food and household items without asking, have you? Jane admitted it without hesitation. Oh, you found out, have you? It's not a problem for me to take things from my son's house. You're not home because of work, and it would be a waste if the food went bad. I was taken aback by her nonchalant attitude. How could she be so calm and unapologetic? I thought, indeed it was Tom's house too, but that didn't justify her actions. Speaking of which, Jane continued, I should mention that you saved up $400,000, didn't you? I used that money to buy a new house. What are you talking about? I asked, confused. There's no need to pretend you don't know. You had it saved in a bank book, right? I was surprised by how much was in it when I opened it. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. She used $400,000 of my savings to buy a house without anyone's permission. But you shouldn't have been able to withdraw the money with just the bank book. How did you get the pin? Oh, you had the pin written on a note inside the bank book, didn't you? Jane said with a smirk. I found it quite easily. I guess I should thank you for making it so accessible. I had let my guard down, thinking no one would look into my bank book. Indeed, I had put a note inside to remember the pen. I was looking for a better living environment, and this worked out perfectly. Jane said, laughing as she left my house. Her actions were unforgivable. 
using someone else's money, without permission was beyond reprehensible. I told Tom about how his mother used my money to buy a house. But his response was infuriating. He acted as if it were none of his concern and said, Let mom do what she wants. Just forget about the $400,000. His dismissive attitude was the last straw. My patience with both him and Jane had worn thin, and I couldn't tolerate any more of their behavior. I decided it was time for some revenge. The next day, I invited Jane over to our house under the pretense of discussing the situation before she arrived. I discreetly activated the voice recorder on my mobile phone to gather evidence. Yesterday, you mentioned using $400,000 from my bank book without permission to buy a new house. Is that true? I asked her. Yes, it's true, Jane confirmed. I've already paid the down payment and construction has started. With the bank book, it's as good as bought. But just having the bank book doesn't mean anything. I pressed. How did you plan to withdraw the money? Jane smiled sweetly and said, I have the seal, don't I? So you took the seal without permission as well? I asked. Mom, that would be considered theft, I added. Say whatever you want, Jane retorted. I never imagined someone who barely does any housework had saved up so much. At least it's somewhat useful. Fine, you can have the bank book, I said, trying to keep my composure. Thank you for coming today. I wanted to confront Jane in anger and reclaim the bank book and seal, but I restrained myself. I had secure evidence of Jane's theft and let her leave. Enjoy it while it lasts, Jane, I thought. The following day, I called Jane again to retrieve what was stolen. Mom, I don't mind giving you the bank book, but it seems personal identification is needed to withdraw the money. I'll go to the bank to withdraw it. So could you please bring the bank book and seal? All right, Jane agreed. I'll bring them over. I hung up the phone feeling a mix of relief and anticipation. I had no intention of withdrawing the $400,000. In this day and age, you can't access such a large amount of money without proper identification. Jane's naivety was astonishing. She seemed completely oblivious to the gravity of her actions, blinded by the lure of easy money. After retrieving the bank book and seal from Jane, I went straight to the police station. I need to report a crime, I said. Jane took my bank book and seal without permission and intends to use them to buy a new house. So you're not the one making the purchase? The officer asked. No, it wasn't me. My bank book and seal were stolen. I'd like to file a report. The police took my statement seriously and accepted the report. That evening, when Tom came home, I informed him about the police report. I went to the police because your mother stole my bank book and seal. She might get arrested soon, I said. What? Why would my mom get arrested? Tom asked, sounding shocked. Because what she did is a serious crime. Just because you say, let mom do what she wants doesn't mean I have to tolerate her stealing from me, I replied. You didn't have to involve the police, Tom said defensively. Am I supposed to stay silent while she commits a crime just because she's a relative by marriage? I didn't save up all this money just to hand it over to Jane, I said. Tom's face flushed with anger. So now you're calling my mother an old hack? That's enough, I said. I'm not going to let her get away with this. Tom stormed off to his room, only to return moments later with a divorce form. I never thought you'd say something like that. Sign this, he demanded. I was taken aback that he had a divorce form ready, but I was equally resolute. If this is how you feel, I'll sign it. Just get it over with, I said. Tom seemed surprised by my willingness to sign so quickly. After I completed the paperwork, he took the form 
and left. I'll submit this to the city hall myself, I said. It was clear Tom wanted to avoid facing me any longer. After our conversation, Tom quickly left the house despite the late hour, likely heading to his mother's place. About 20 minutes later, my phone rang. Hello, I answered. It's Tom, came the voice on the other end. I told Mom that Rose filed a police report. Could you withdraw it? No way, I said firmly. Even if she's pretending to be remorseful, it doesn't change anything. I won't forgive her. She's likely to do this again. Another call came in. Hello, I asked, annoyed. I'm sorry, said a tearful voice. It wasn't Tom, it was Jane. She was crying and apologizing, but her tears did nothing to soften my stance. You think crying and apologizing will make me forgive you? You took not only the bank book, but also the seal. How do you explain that? I've always wanted a single-family home, Jane explained. After living in apartments for so long, I couldn't resist using the money. I know it was wrong, but I've been managing our finances and saw the $400,000. I couldn't help myself. That doesn't excuse anything, I replied coldly. I worked hard for that money before I even married your son. You can't just make it right by apologizing. Reflect on this in prison. Jane tried to make another appeal. Please, I have a request. A request? How audacious. What is it? I've already paid a $100,000 down payment from my savings, and I can't stop the construction. Could you lend me the $400,000? promising to repay it without fail. Are you delusional? I responded. There's no way. I'm lending you anything. I can't trust someone who steals, not just a bank book, but also food and household items, to repay me. What should I do then? Jane asked, desperation evident in her voice. That's your problem to figure out. I'm not responsible for cleaning up your mess. Why don't you ask your son to take out a loan? Jane's panic was almost amusing, but I had no sympathy left. Just as I was about to end the call, Tom intervened. Please don't abandon Mom. You were taken care of by her too. Even if it's not the full amount, please help her. She comes over every day just to criticize and has a spare key, but doesn't help around the house. What care did she give me? I countered. Tom had no response, clearly grasping at straws in a desperate attempt to appeal to my emotions. I won't help at all. Good luck. Wait. I'll take care of Mom so she won't be a burden to you. Can we cancel the divorce? Tom pleaded. It's too late for that now, I said. Your mother is clearly the most important thing to you. You never protected me. I'm done. Enjoy your time with her. We'll be strangers by tomorrow. I hung up, turning off my phone to avoid more calls. Tom didn't return that night. They were probably comforting each other while I was left to deal with the aftermath. I took a day off work to submit the divorce papers to City Hall. With that, Tom and I became strangers. Whatever happened to his mother was no longer my concern. During the three days leading up to my move, Tom and I barely spoke. I didn't initiate any conversation either. I planned to stay at my parents' house, an hour's commute from work, which was manageable. As I left the house that Tom and I had shared, he said, I'm sorry for everything. I ignored him and walked out. It was a surprising end to a marriage that had once been filled with love. Yet, strangely, I felt no sadness only relief at being free from such a terrible mother and son. I couldn't forgive the hurtful words and actions. This outcome was a direct result of Tom's neglect and his constant prioritization of his mother over me. If he had taken a firm stand against her when she used my bank book to buy a house, perhaps I might have reconsidered. Jane and Tom had underestimated me. 
I wasn't going to end this passively. They would now face the burden of loan repayments, which was precisely what Jane wanted. They were both accountable for their actions. I reflected on this as I drove to my parents' house. A week later, the police contacted me to inform me that Jane had been arrested on suspicion of theft. It turned out that not living with her had been a decisive factor in her arrest. Had I lived with my mother-in-law, the case might have been considered theft among relatives, making an arrest difficult. I was relieved and thanked the police before ending the call. Jane would now have the chance to truly reflect on her crimes in prison. Just then, Tom called. Hello. My mom got arrested, he said. I know. The police just informed me, I replied. With her gone, there's no way I can pay off the loan by myself. So what? What do you want from me? Are you asking for my help? He asked. No, don't call me anymore, I said and hung up. To ensure he couldn't contact me again, I blocked his number and messages. A month later, I received an unexpected message from a coworker. Hey, what were you thinking? Tom left the organization. Even though Tom and I worked for the same firm, we didn't often interact because we were in different divisions. Apparently, Tom was finding it very difficult to stay at the company once word got out of his mother's incarceration. I was not involved in the chatter and didn't know what became of him, but I imagine he was having trouble making the loan installments. I remarried three years later to someone who genuinely values me, someone I met entirely outside of the workplace. I am grateful for my new in-laws, who have embraced me with open arms. I believe that I have at last discovered true happiness, and I hope that I never go through something like again.